Hi there, and welcome back to the Community Strategy Podcast. My name is Deb Shell, and I'm the host here. If you've been listening to this season, we're in season three, and our focus for this season is community builders with purpose. If you are not a member of the Community Builders with Purpose community, uh, I will have a link in the show notes for you to join us. We're going to have some upcoming free masterminds and workshops in the fall, so be on the lookout for that uh, in your email. Today, I'm excited to introduce a a friend of mine and somebody who I've very much admired over the last few years since I've worked with him. Chris Fitz is the founder and artistic director of River Crossing Playback based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The ensemble led by Chris builds community through dramatic uh, portrayal of real life stories. He has trained and performed improvisational art since 2003 in Pennsylvania, Germany, Washington, D.C., and across the U.S. He was formerly the executive director for the Center of for Community Peacemaking, a community-based mediation and restorative justice resource in Lancaster, and he's also a trained mediator and well-versed in restorative justice. His work has been featured in Lancaster newspapers and online media. And uh, restorative justice is a set of community practices and principles to address harm and create healing in community schools and criminal legal systems. Playback theater shares the values with restorative justice and performances can usually be support personal and social healing. Welcome, Chris, to the Community Strategy Podcast. Thanks, Deb. Thanks. Kind introduction. I forgot that I did all that, so... <laughs> you to did put it all there. I was doing some research on you this morning and and finding all of these amazing things about you that I didn't know, and I was like, "Wow, there's so many things about Chris." So, um, my kids call it dad lore now. Sometimes that a story <laughs> comes out of nowhere, and they're like, "Uh oh, dad lore." <laughs> That's cute. Um, So I met you uh, a few years ago uh, via our mutual friend, Janet, and uh, you have been leading playback theater. And so tell us a little about, tell me a little Mm -hmm. bit about, and the people listening here, about you and a little bit about uh, playback. Yeah. So um, I grew up in, in South Central Pennsylvania and um, very in, in a pretty, uh, rural and um, farm-based family, and by family I mean extended family, and so I've always had a sense of connection and purpose and meaning about where I grew up. And uh, when I went to college, I realized that actually that's not true for a lot of people in the United States. That they kind of grow up very disconnected from their family, far like many miles away, if not many states away. And the sense of community built into their lives growing up was very different than mine. So that's that's something that I noticed and also recognized when I had kids a couple of decades after um, or a decade and a half after um, being in college, I realized that to raise them near where they had a family network and a community network uh, was a unique resource for us that again, many people don't have their families being scattered across many distances. And and sometimes I think that's actually part of the cultural disconnect and like cultural and political disconnect we have in our country has to do with different senses of and values of how important family is and community and um, and the, how we conceive of family and community um, being something we can like assemble technologically um, with or with technical technological support versus something that we can um, that really does require being close um, proximity of some sort. I, I I'm partial to both, right? I, I live in both of those worlds. I'm not an either or kind of person in that regard. But that's all part of the sort of background that I that sort of launched me in the direction of thinking about community as a um as as something to develop, both in the work that I did in college related to peace and conflict resolution, thinking about it not being 
necessarily a interpersonal conflict resolution or peace building work, and also not it being a political, essentially a political experience, but a communal or group experience, how to facilitate group experiences and community experiences um, was a big interest of, of mine and, of, and uh, some of the work and study and the practices that I developed out of college and graduate school were really about that. And out of those came my interest in using theater and the arts as creative ways of developing community space and community trust and community belonging um, that are that go well beyond like just talking um, and and sort of t what I would say is talk methods. Um, so that's a little that's a general background of sort of some of some of where I I developed both where I am now in, in South Central Pennsylvania, not too far from you, but also uh, my interest in in building community. York, for example, I think a few a number of years back, I think in 2015, mm -hmm. you were working with York to to have some of these conversations around belonging in the York area, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about some of the, the work that you did with Playback at that time or when you started with Playback? <laughs> sure. Um, and yeah, I should also just maybe say, um, in a, if we were in a room, I would say, how many of you have heard of Playback Theater? You know, I would do a, but here we are. Um, and I don't know who's listening. So uh, uh, many people I've encountered do not know what playback theater is. And I will describe it differently depending on who they are and what their understanding of theater and improvisation and so forth is. But essentially, it's an improvisational form in which we as, as a trained group of actors, musician, facilitator, we, are, we offer a sort of a space for people to tell stories that is um, stories that allow them to be vulnerable, allow trust to develop and, and really support them hearing each other's stories in new ways. And, and part of the work of, the, of our theater practice in doing that is that we are discovering the essences of the stories that are being told. And we're discovering them by listening in certain ways, embodied ways, but also by like our artistry being a discovery process. And so I know that sounds somewhat vague, but essentially people come to a performance or a workshop and they're sharing responses to questions and we play them back. And they're like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that that is what I really felt, but I, I feel heard in it by watching it play back and heard by everyone, not just not just by them, the troupe, or by, you know, or my own self-reflection. And so um, we move then into a process where people are hearing each other's stories and the stories are starting to speak to each other. And so we're it's it's very much a community space. It while some people call it therapeutic uh, or um, it is not therapy. Um, and, but it is therapeutic in the sense of not just people being having more insight into their own stories and their own lives, but having insight into other people's stories and lives speaking to them. And so it is sort of this inherent community or group experience that you can't do by yourself. Um, and and so we have offered this kind of um, performance, uh, or form of improvisation to um, in various community spaces where we've seen the need. And when I moved back to this area from um, living uh, living abroad, actually, um, there was a big need for recognition of past uh, racial harm, um, racialized racist harm that had occurred in in uh, in York. County, especially in York City, and so we got involved in a process. Uh, what, what was at that time called Healing York, um, to just um, have people be able to talk about and recognize and acknowledge, and have acknowledged the harm that has happened. Um, and when we talk about harm, it's very cr easy. It crosses into this restorative justice world as well, which is all about. It's not about crime. It's about harm. 
and harm is experienced subjectively and harm is processed subjectively and intersubjectively, right? Like we, we are healed through our, through relationships of recognition. Yeah. So not just through going and having a personal event um, and personal healing journey, but having somebody else say, I hear you, I see you, I see how you have been harmed and how harmful your experience has been. And I wish for something different in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, Essentially, that's what apology and apology is. But I like to think of acknowledgement as really the heart of an apology, the, 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 the bones of an apology, really, like it's the inner apology of recognizing, um, recognizing hurt and, and really, and in, in really like tangible, concrete ways. So playback theater is a, is a form for doing that, not only for um, people, the people telling a story, but every, everybody participating is in a way participating in this kind of ritualized experience. And something else has been lost in our sort of modern society is like ritual um, experiences. And, um, and what does ritual mean? It means it confers an extra value and a sacredness even to the experiences, the stories that are told. Uh, an, an extra level of respect. And so that happens uniquely through through a playback theater kind of experience. There are other ways that that ritualized um, experiences uh, recognizing harm happens. The circle process is an example of that in uh, in the in many indigenous traditions and then now in the sort of the traditions of restorative justice, um, it it tends to be more ritualized and, respectful than just, okay, we're here to talk about this. Let's get started. You know, um, there, there's a level of like ceremony and, and respect that's brought into these events that are really critical for them to, um, to acknowledge what's very painful sometimes. So this is what we did in York, um, using, using the <clears throat> playback theater, process a series of performances essentially and there's a lot to be learned a lot to be improved upon um and really the, i see this kind of work the the value of it being in repetition actually um or the value is ex, is sort of comp- fulfilled by having it happen multiple times by having a dialogue and not just a one time like okay, I got to tell this story, got that off my chest. I'm going to go home now and feel better. Like, no, racism and the harm of that people have experienced in different kinds of discrimination or different kinds of, um, yeah, bullying growing up, for example, um, doesn't need to be identity-based. Those those harms last a long time, and we don't get rid of them by telling one story once. So. I do see whatever is needed in our society is needed more than once. It, it's needed as a practice, as a sort of a, almost a tra- new tradition in a way. Mm-hmm. Community building online and in person, we talk a lot about rituals and mm. how to um, continue. Uh, you know, a lot of my clients say, well, how do I get them to keep coming back? Because it's really easy to open up a community and say, here, everybody, here's the link to join my Facebook group, or here's the link to join my my network. And everybody says, oh, cool. And they click on it and they come in and they join. And then they never come back sometimes. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, a lot of the things that I've learned in this is specifically related to rituals Mm -hmm. and building this bit of like checking in with each other and building relationships with each other. Because if we are only there to for example, read content or learn something, but we're not actually able to practice it and embody it uh, using some of the words there, Mm -hmm. then Mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to implement that in our lives. And so I think that's a lot of online learning um, can be benefited by this companion of community and transforming that. And also the connection of in-person, having the ability to if you can, which a lot of communities online do transition in person and have hybrid models. So mm. I think mm. just those 
benefits of having some people are never going to be able to access, you know, a community because of their location or their limited yeah. abilities, but other, you know, so that way they can p- participate in an online setting. But mm-hmm. all of those things said, the the aspect of habits and rituals and that that helps to cultivate this feeling of this is something that I'm belonging to and that I want to keep showing up for and that it's important in my life and I prioritize it versus mm-hmm. somebody who doesn't feel that way and isn't going to prioritize it and isn't going to come back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've begun to think of my work and my training work. I do training in restorative justice and restorative practices and mediation. And I've begun to think of it and partly because I'm uh, I'm unpacking that work because I'm training other people to do it. So I'm becoming more conscious of things that I do that work and that don't work. And one of the stories that I track in a training is a story of energy. Uh, so like, what's the energy like? What are What's a quality for the energy? And I actually invite people to reflect, like, what's the energy like in the room right now? And have them call out a word. You know, give a, give me a word or a phrase of what's the energy like right now for you. And um, sometimes that can show you like the good energy words, the easy words that people can share. So it's not always like the most insightful thing, but it helps people to become aware. Um, and it helps me as a facilitator kind of keep track of and make explicit the community development um, because if I'm sharing a PowerPoint and like get to the end and say any questions, um, it's going to be still all about the PowerPoint and not about their relationships and their sense of energy to engage and their desire to come back. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, I, I've heard, I've heard somebody um, sort of riff off of a, of a, um, a great riff off of a um, uh, a popular saying, which is um, power corrupts, but PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. And um, the the sort of the the use of PowerPoint in so many situations, especially in a training context, is um, so much drains energy and mm-hmm. so, is so much taking away from potential for like when you gather people like you there's so much potential for them to have a voice and have like have an energetic participation element i'll just share one one of the like the top um tools that i've used is pair work so asking a question giving a very defined amount of time and saying talk for a minute in your breakout room and your pair or like to the person next to you, talk for a minute about what brought you here today. Um, and then then the switch, get, make it, you know, structure the time that they have. So it's not on and on and on, um, but really support them having a sense of like participation and energetic, and also a sense of like being able to serve and listen to somebody else and, and to support them. And so I've found that that raises the energy those kind of pair exercises both in live and and online have been almost invariably have people have come back with just so much appreciation and so much readiness to respond and engage and develop uh, Mm -hmm. and support. Yeah. When I do, I don't know about you, but when I do events online, I have workshops, I just did a workshop yesterday and I have a Mm -hmm. slide deck, but I tend to um, like have it for a moment and then go yeah. into group conversation mm-hmm. um, and then do maybe do breakout rooms and then come back and have another group conversation. And then I bring back up my slide and we move to another thing. And uh-huh. I think that really works well because it gives mm. us a balance of like some structure where they're seeing some, you right. know, some kind of content that's giving them a, 
here's what we're talking about. A common framework, yeah. Yeah, and then having them be able to share and and discuss what they're working on and how they're feeling about it and all those things. And one mm-hmm. of the things I was really impressed with when I first met you was this sense of being able to be seen. I, I talk a lot about that in online communities because social mm. media doesn't really allow us to be seen because it's more... Mm. It's more about how we're trying to impress other people or something. A lot of the right, time, less right, about right. reality. It's more about how we're perceived right. and, and presenting. Yeah, and presenting instead of us being our authentic selves, which leads to that disconnect that you were talking about, and where we can be when we can be in community with people where we can be ourselves. Is what people actually really want right now. Is they want to spend time mm-hmm. with people in community but where they can be who they are <laughs> um, without right. having to feel right. like impressing or something. And so when I met you and, and watched some playback practices, I felt that sense of connectedness and um, ability mm-hmm. to uh, of acceptance. That's another big mm-hmm. thing that we talk about in community building mm-hmm. is, is um, feeling accepted. You know, when you walk into a room, um, if you don't know anybody there, going to be a lot harder for you to walk around maybe and introduce yourself to people versus a room mm-hmm. you know you see a couple of friends across the room and you walk over and you're like waving to them and it's a different yeah. energy like you're talking about as well so yeah. I, yeah those are different ways to perceive um how how we experience mm-hmm. um, community mm-hmm. i want to switch gears a little bit and ask yeah. you about um your transition during the pandemic i know pre-pandemic Um, I, I've been told I wasn't around then, but that, uh, you know, your your troop was very active and there was a lot of, it seemed like energy and, um, and then maybe some of that was lost during the pandemic. How did you uh, transition that at that time? Hmm. Because you were so focused of in-person and I know you did, then you did do some workshops online Mm -hmm. and, um, recognized in the newspaper for doing some things as well. So, Hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of ways that we were like hanging on in the pandemic, like, um, and a lot of ways that we were like, I'm not sure this is going to work, that we were very skeptical. And we brought all of that sort of sense of maybe desperation and skepticism and frustration and despair. Um, and I would say those are exaggerated versions of what we yeah. felt perhaps sometimes, but um, but they were part of it. And, and I think out of that came like the real desire to like, no, we need to connect. We need, even if it's not the best connection ways that we know in which we can be physically present to each other and like playful and like pushing on each other literally and, and so forth. And in the, the ways that we practice, um, our very physical and connecting, um, um, a lot of us were bringing this desperation and we brought it online too. And um, an example of that is that there was around the invasion of Ukraine, which was toward the end of the pandemic um, when a lot of us were still kind of in isolated situations. Um, there was a fundraiser for Ukraine because we there were playback theater troops in Ukraine um, I should say playback theater companies or groups in Ukraine that were directly impacted by the invasion from Russian forces. And, and so there was just an outpouring of support for, um, this was a very concrete way that we could support Ukrainian, Ukraine, Ukrainian communities, Ukrainian civilians in in a sort of resilience and and potentially also resistance to this huge violence that was occurring so there was a lot of there were a lot of people that we we did one show that we sent um sent on funds to ukrainian local ukrainian playback theater troops that were working locally with various um hospitals and schools essentially uh, from what i understand so um yeah so we were quite involved in that and people showed up to those performances from the uk and from other places in the world even though we don't have personally a a member who is from ukraine right Right. so um it was pretty exciting and and 
heartening that there was a way to plug in to this larger community and and that playback theater could be adapted to the online environment in post covid what i see is like people have like gone back to like overloading their schedules and so in covid there was like all this space because people canceled all these other things and big events were canceled and now all these big events are happening and people are putting a lot of energy into all kinds of opportunities it's wonderful um and i feel that it's the, like the market for workshops and something like a playback theater performance is again crowded as it was pre-pandemic um and one of the things that crowds it is like big events i would just say like they take a ton of time to organize and i think it's always questionable like what happens in a big event because they're like once a year maybe. And it's like, how does that connect to other community, like actual relationship building and so forth? You know, and conferences and annual events, there is a, a real missed opportunity to connect those people throughout the year. And mm -hmm. the more and more mm -hmm. I see um, platforms that are trying to build community throughout the year, mm -hmm. I think those are the ones that, you know, mm -hmm. have, have more success in, getting people to come back to their events year after year mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're building that connection and, you know, creating some kind of way for those people to stay connected throughout the year versus, mm -hmm. oh, I just got a bunch of people's business cards and now it's on me to, you know, connect mm -hmm. to people or right. decide what I'm going to do or just I'm never talking to anybody <laughs> again totally. yes. or whatever. Um, and, and online community is a really good connector for the in-between. Uh -huh. The in between, the in between. The, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I see that as a really big missed opportunity for a lot of companies. That for sure, if they if they said, "Oh, I want to invest in community online um, to be able to have our members be more participating and be engaged throughout the year," you know, yeah. workshops maybe once a quarter or some some kind mm -hmm. of that help them continue. Mm -hmm to learn and connect versus here's a flashy thing that we're doing and then it's over and then we're right. not now we're just going to wait until next year and now we're trying to tell you about next year <laughs> right 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 yeah yeah just a thought there but anyway what are you thankful for with with playback because i just thought when you always end the the um sessions we do this thing about it was I don't know if you call it a gratitude circle, but that's what it makes me feel like. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, it's very much based on a gratitude frame of mind. Mm -hmm. um, we we bump into people that are like, uh, for example, um, dealing with a situation of homelessness uh, where, where there's a lot of folks who are unhoused who are inhabiting the city square in Lancaster. And people have come up to us and said, you do process facilitation. I think there's a need for that, not just us having solutions, but for us having a good process that arrives at solutions. And so what I'm seeing in over 10 years is more and more people understand the value of process and understand um, why it matters and why, why it's worth paying for, right. ultimately. Right. And that is... It is a big shift from uh, sort of let's just have a town hall meeting, let people yell at each other and <laughs> hope for the best. Um, and and so the understanding we can do things differently in a way that transforms the outcomes. I've enjoyed spending time with learning all about playback and uh, find it so interesting to be able to connect more with our bodies. And I think that's one of the first mm -hmm. things you talk about is connecting with your body. And we have like a check-in um, and we walk, you know, we go around and we do some motions. So I thought I'd just end real quick with just a very, very short check out for you. Nice. And yeah. So I wanted you to just um, help me with that. Ah, thank you, Deb. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, find a way, a place that we're comfortable and take a deep breath. And when we take a deep breath, the exhale is just as important as the inhale, something I've learned doing this work. 
another breath. And um, just noticing um, any tension you have and from head to toe, and especially like when we sit down, like shoulders can be, um, can get tense. So like shoulders or back or hips that we neglect when we're sitting and we'll focus here. Yeah, so um, maybe uh, a word of appreciation, we can each share a word or phrase of appreciation or of learning that we're coming up with as to close. Appreciation. Um, uh, ecstatic energy, I would say. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Word coming up for me is um, finding the flow of our movements. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you yeah. for being here and for sharing some of uh, your work. And uh, tell people if they're listening and they'd like to connect with you or learn more about what you're doing, where's the best place for them to go? Mm -hmm. um, so I have a playback theater website, rivercrossingplayback.org. And um, that's one way we have a contact, uh, we have contact info on that website. And the work that I do in mediation restorative practices through ADVOS, A-D-V-O-Z at uh, .org. And um, there's ways to find out more info there and contact me as well. Yeah. And we didn't even get to talk about any of that, but like a lot of right. that. Some of it. Came in. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't deep dive into that, but I, I, I researched that a little bit too and thought that was really interesting. So, well, thank you for being here and um, appreciate yeah. you helping me wrap up part of uh, my season for doing this. three. Um, yeah. And for every, for you listening, uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. If you did, please share it with somebody that you think might enjoy it as well. Um, and if you really liked it, it would be awesome if you gave me an Apple rating um, and I have um, instructions on how to do that. And so I'd love for you to do that. And that's it. So uh, have a great rest of your moment, day, week, whatever that is. And I'll see you again. Take care.